Well, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening for this year's juried student exhibition juror presentation. Um, I'm, I'm, I, I probably should preface this by apologizing for all of the kind of ups and downs and, and plan changes with the show. We were hoping to be back in complete in-person physical exhibition this year, um, but uh, things kind of didn't go the way we had planned, um, including the schedule. So we thought this might be a good option, um, but we are certainly glad that you could join us this, this evening and uh, meet this year's juror, Emily Stamey. Um, she will be announcing the award winners for this year's show. And also toward the end of the conversation, I thought it would be great since I've had a lot of students approach me and just ask about curatorial and you know how to follow a curatorial path in their work. Um, I thought it would be great since we have Emily here for her to provide a little insight into her own professional path and how she got to where she is. Um, uh, first of all, thank you, Emily, for being the juror this year. Uh, you've been excellent to work with, super punctual, super timely. That's so helpful. Um, Emily Stamey is the curator of exhibitions at the Weatherspoon Art Museum, and that is a part of UNC Greensboro. And I think you started there in October of 19. Is that correct, Emily? Uh, six, 16. 16. Yeah. And before that, you were the curator of contemporary art in uh, Scottsdale MoCA in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And you're the curator of modern and contemporary art for the Ulrich Museum in Wichita State University in Kansas. Yeah. And you received your PhD and your master's from the University of Kansas Lawrence and your BA in art history from uh, Grinnell College in Iowa. And so with that, I would like to pass this over to Emily and she can take it away. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Um, and truly, thank you for the invitation to do this. I, I love these opportunities and this one proved you know, just as fun as I would have hoped that it might. Um, it was an incredible range of work to go through. So you know, kudos to everybody who submitted. I was, I was genuinely so impressed by the range of styles, the range of topics people were choosing to invest in, um, the techniques people were exploring. Um, so it was a real treat to go through all the work. It was real tough to whittle it down to the pieces that we will highlight tonight. Um, so I'm really thrilled that there is an online exhibition that will include so many more. You know, there's going to be a small physical exhibition, smaller than normal, um, but that the, the online one will allow a chance to have lots of work shown. So I'm, I'm very excited for that and encourage everyone to look at that online when it goes live tomorrow. Correct, tomorrow? Yep. Correct. All right. So I am going to share my screen here and bear with me through the quick technicals. All right, a thumbs up. Are we all seeing a, a starting screen? Wonderful, all right. Well then without any further ado, I am just going to jump right in. We're gonna start with the honorable mentions. Um, arranged alphabetically, or at least I think I got my alphabet in order here. So, um, you know, no, no preference shown one over another. Um, and I've got just a few words about each piece. We can't go into all of them in depth. And of course, I haven't had a chance to talk to the artist. So, you know, there's so much more I could learn about any one of these, but I thought I'd share just a few of, you know, sort of the quick things that jumped out at me when I was going through all of the submissions. So first up, Jonathan Apgar. Um, with this painting, I was really taken by the range of mark making that's in here. So you take a quick first look and it feels like, oh, it's drips and maybe it's some brushwork. Um, but then you spend time with it and there's both really angular line work within here. There's really gestural line work within here. There's really intriguing little spots where it almost looked like the paint has been splattered and then pulled away. Like we get these areas of negative space. I'd be curious to learn more about how those were done. Um, but anyhow, just a really rich range of texture and mark making in here that I thought was really fabulous. Next up, Sydney Carmer. Sydney, if you're on here, this should load here in a moment. It's been slow every time I've done this. Um, 
and I'll start describing it in case it doesn't pop up here and then everyone can look at it online tomorrow. But this is this wonderful 20 second digital animation. And we have this amazing scene of like this diner in a really sort of almost creepy landscape. And yet there's something really inviting about it. There's a lovely play of color in these sort of purples in the sky and in the ground, and then this darkness all around and a few pops of neon on the diner. And we will see, Oh, there it goes. Um, so there is this lovely image. And I I just, the colors themselves and the way that it went from the almost like monochromatic or sepia photograph tones to these bright pops, I thought was really great. And the way that it both sort of scared me and enticed me all at once, I thought was really lovely. All right, next, Kelly Gilbert. Um, this is just exquisite draftsmanship. I mean, this is just great. And I love the, the contrast and the holding together of both this super realism within the, the crafting of the figure, but then also this, you know, abstract gestural work that gives us this really dynamic sense of energy. I mean, this is like palpably energetic when you look at it. And I loved that. Um, Dominique Denari. Um, so this just brought a huge smile to my face the minute this image came up. I mean, there is just a fantastic sense of humor in here. I love that in this, you know, sneaker car wash that we have going on that we've even got one guy like down on the bottom with the broom turned around, like cleaning out the tread. Um, and the up on the top tongue of the sneaker, we've got, you know, a tree air freshener, like we might hang off of our rear view mirror. Um, so that was that was just super charming to engage with. Um, and then Sammy Pasito, you know, I I'm hard put to like really articulate exactly what it is that struck me in here, other than to say that like everything my eye needed was right in this image. So like clearly this scene expands off to the left and the right. We're getting, you know, a cropped view of a landscape. And yet within that is everything that can hold my attention from the reflections to this really interesting curve of the waterline against the shore to the tiny bits of, you know, urban landscape that we get peeking up in the far background, the difference in the clouds that you see top and bottom, like just a smart capturing of composition. And then Bryce Puckett, um, another one that made me smile the minute I saw this image. So there's, you know, there's great craftsmanship going on in this. Like, how do we get these things to balance and what are the mechanics there and how is it built and put together? Um, but then in this title separated, like I couldn't help but think of like a little kid who's run off from its parents and the parent is like off to go gather it and scoop it back up again. Um, Embrace if that's not at all what it is intended to reflect, you know, forgive me, but I'm, I'm saying that with great joy that I just, I love the little scene and the way that these almost seemed a little bit anthropomorphic, like there's sort of a little narrative going on within this. I thought that was really lovely. Um, so kudos to all of our honorable mentions, and we will move on to our third runner up, which is Heather Chan with this just incredible mask, you know, and I just spent so much time looking at this and wishing that Heather, if you're on here, that I could see you in this, you know, in person and see it performed, see it acted out, see what it might do. Um, I love that it has these references to different animals. So we've got like almost like this feathery bit going on here, but then this reach that makes me think, you know, so the feathers would be a bird I realized they're not actual feathers on here, but they made me think of feathers. And then this long reach that would make me think of a giraffe. But then you've got these industrial references, like, is it a pipe? Is it like, I don't know, some kind of um, tunnel? Is it like, what, what is it? And how does it get activated? So this was just completely captivating to me. I loved it. Second runner up, Asia Spinks Hannon. Um, and Asia, the mark making in this was just 
exquisite. I mean, overall, it's just, it's an eloquent image. That was, that was the first word that came to mind when I looked at it. Um, but the care and attention to how, particularly in the face and the neck, how the skin is formed with that really fine mark making. And then the overlay of the pattern of the hands on this kid's shirt, like, and the way they're laid in there, like, are they a part of the design on the shirt itself, but they don't quite lay right that way? Are they like these kind of like almost like ghost marks or references to, you know, a parent picking the child up and, and touch that is always part of, of being a small child. Um, so a really lovely balance here of dense, intense line, these open negative spaces, and then this other patterning. First runner up. Rory Hines. Um, I loved the balance and imbalance in this. You know, so if I call into my mind an image of a teapot um, without having one in front of me, you know, this is not the kind of handle that I think of. Like this handle seems a little bit outsized and yet on this, it feels absolutely perfect. Like that is the size that it needs to be, the shape that it needs to be. Um, I also love the variation in the glazing and the texture that we get coming through. It's like so simple and polished and yet not perfectly polished. It's got all those little bits of variation um, that I love to see in ceramic work like this. And then our best in show, Kaya Anderson Head. Um, another one that made me smile as soon as I opened it up. I mean, there is a great sense of humor in this. Um, but, but far more than that was just this incredible sense of line, work with line, balance in the composition. There is a lot going on in this image. And you can lose sight of that by getting caught up in, you know, this funny image of a a pious nose, you know, of a nose praying and a nose wearing clothes and, and the goofiness of that. Um, and, and my guess is this refers to a story that I'm not going to remember the title of, but I think it's a Russian short story that I have heard tell of. It's not Dostoevsky, but I'm going to forget who it is. Um, so we have that sort of illustrating of the story, but then we've got all these details, you know, so all these little items over in these devotional cases, the, the decorative work on the doors, the decorative work in the lights, the way the windows and the columns and the pillars are arranged, the sense of light streaming through. Um, you know, it's a still image, but it's dynamic. Um, there's so much different kinds of mark making going on, all balanced together, this amazing positive and negative space. Um, this is just, is a phenomenal drawing. So, um, so those are our award winners. And I'm just, I'm so thrilled for all of you that you're making this level of work as undergraduates. Um, and I'm really excited to see where you go with all of it. Um, you know, my huge kudos. I wish I could see all your faces. Your faces all disappear when I'm sharing my screen, so I can't see you. Um, but, you know, cheers. This is really great work. I, I also, I love Kaya's piece too. And you know, the more I look at it, the more the details I see, like, um, you know, she's included a nose up in the round arch that should be like a portrait of a saint, maybe there are noses on the cover of the Psalter of the or the holy book or whatever that is there um, in the front. And uh, I, I, I agree, I think this is a really great piece. Yeah. Um, I also I... agree that, you know, the, this work is really great. I mean, um, you know, in these, certainly in these times, we're not really sure, you know, how many pieces to expect um, to be submitted for the jury shows, but um, the students, they never disappoint, and we get a good number and good quality of work, and so I want to, you know, congratulate everybody who submitted, and also remind everyone that, that these award winners that Emily just announced um, they will be on view in the side gallery and upstairs in row until March 31st. So they'll go up tomorrow and then you can stop by and see them anytime uh, until the 31st. And that's just uh, another way of celebrating the award winners. And, and here's to looking forward and next year having a full on in-person physical exhibition with a reception and, and back to where we, we used to be. So uh, 
Um, I, I just want to say that just because these shows have been virtual, it, it doesn't mean at all um, that they're not as important as a physical exhibition. Um, the only good thing about a physical exhibition is that we get to see the work in person and we get to talk to all of you in person. So uh, we're hoping that we can do that again next year. Um, before we move on to, to um, let Emily talk a little bit about her professional path, um, I wanted to open the floor to anyone who might have questions for her or maybe some of the artists who created these award-winning pieces, if you're on, uh, if you have some comments or if we have some people who might wanna ask the artists some questions. I just wanted to take a few minutes uh, for a little Q&A before we shift gears a little bit. So you can, uh, you can write a, a question in the chat if you'd like. Uh, you're certainly um, allowed uh, to vocalize your question as well. So does anybody have any questions or comments at this point? And Adam, I can't see the chat from where I'm with my screen share up. So I'll let you tell me if we've got questions. Okay. No questions, no comments. I have a question. Yeah, please. Um, if anyone would be willing to answer. Um, all the pieces are like really interesting and I feel like greatly executed. I was wondering like if if there was like a time frame, like how long did it take to conceptualize to create them? That's a really great question. I mean, do I I think we have some of the uh the artists who are award winners on the meeting tonight. Would anybody like to answer that? No takers. Well, I, Bethany, I, I think that's a really great question. And, and also as a side of that question, you know, what inspired them within the, the classroom setting to produce these two? Um, those are always really great questions to ask, ask the artists. Okay, well, if there are any other questions, we can, we can move forward and we'll, we'll have another uh, kind of Q&A period after the second uh, portion of the, the presentation. So don't worry if you think of something related to this, we can always come back. Yeah, absolutely. So if, if let this all like percolate in your heads. And if you have more questions for the artists or comments, when I'm done with my next little bit, we can always jump back to any of these images. We don't have to stick on the, the next round of things that I share. Um, so this has, feels like kind of a grand title, Art World Reflections, as if I know all things about the art world, which is certainly not the case. but Art world according to Emily. So the bit of the art world that I have known and how I've made my way through it. Um, so a little biographical romp here with some reflections as I go. And, you know, as I pulled a few images together and thought about what I might share in just, you know, a little bit of time, the two things that kept coming to my mind were to be open to where you land in the art world and in the world in general. Um, as we'll share, I have landed in a place I never dreamed I would when I was, you know, in high school. Had you asked me would I be living in North Carolina someday, I would have said no, <laughs> um, which is true of pretty much every place that I will show you along the, the route tonight. Um, and then the other would be see the, every opportunity that falls in front of you, if it feels like a good fit, even if it feels like it's out of the realm of what you know or what you think you want to do or what you thought your career was going to be because you never know what tool it's going to put in your little you know proverbial toolbox or where it's going to lead you to next um so i grew up in a small college town in northwest washington um all, almost canada so you know up on the water up in the very very corner um a town that i would say had a really rich craft community in it, but maybe not, you know, um, fine arts in the way that we, that I think of it in the spaces where I work. That has changed since I grew up there. Um, but when I was a kid, I went mainly to this building that you see on the left, which was our local 
art and history and culture and it was like Museum of Arts, Industry, Culture, something else. It had a very long title. Um, and what I mostly remember are stuffed dead birds that totally creeped me out. Um, but to my mother's credit, she hauled us there regularly. And so I did get, you know, the few art exhibitions that turned over in there did, you know, they, they lodged. And I wouldn't say they were my favorite thing at the time that she took me, but they clearly made an impression because I wound up loving art classes. And so, you know, I was always picking art as my elective in, you know, middle school and high school and doing that. I was not good. There's a reason I am now a curator and not a practicing artist, but I, but I love them. Um, what made a huge impression on me as a, as a high schooler um, were field trips that I would take with my high school to Seattle. So we would go to the big city. Like you all are in Charlotte right now. So like, and I don't know how many of you grew up, you know, in an urban area, but like this was super exciting when we would get on this bus and we would go into Seattle and we went to the Seattle Art Museum, which of course, you know, made a great impression. But interestingly, the activity that ultimately showed me what I wanted to do in life, but I couldn't have told you that that's really what it was doing at the time, were these trips we took to opera rehearsals, which is the image you see on the left, it's Seattle Opera House. And we would get to go down and watch dress rehearsals. They would let students come in for free. And there was a guy there who, you know, I now know must have a title like opera educator or public outreach or something. I had no idea who he was at the time. His name was Perry Lorenzo. He had a really cool name. And he would teach us about the operas. And he would get this busload of high school kids crazy excited about opera of all things, which, you know, I had no interest in opera before all of this started. And somehow in my head, I was like, God, someday when I grow up, I want to be the Perry Lorenzo of an art museum because I really like art and I want to make other people like art too. And that was it. I knew nothing about museum jobs. I couldn't have told you what a curator was or a registrar or a prepared or like all these jobs that we, that, that I shouldn't even say we, cause you may all not know these titles either. Like I didn't know that one could actually work in a museum. I just knew I liked going to them. And I knew this guy, Perry Lorenzo did cool things and got people excited. And I thought maybe somewhere in the world, I can make people excited about art. Um, but with all that said, like, I didn't know what all that meant. So I went off to college to become what I thought would be an English teacher, because I did know what English teachers were. I'd had many of them all throughout my, my school year. Um, I went to college in Iowa, which is one of these, you never know where you will land. So I'm a girl raised in Northwest Washington. I only applied to schools in Washington, Oregon, and California until the 11th hour when my read about Grinnell College in a US News and World Report article that said it was the best buy for a liberal arts college that year and told me I should apply. And I had some choice words for my father. I'd never used inappropriate language with my dad, but my answer was, dad, there's no way in blank that I'm moving to Iowa. And he said, no, just, it sounds like everything you want, apply. It doesn't hurt. I'm paying for your application. And I said, okay. And lo and behold, I got in. And they gave me a nice scholarship and I went there and it was hands down one of the best decisions I've ever made in my life. It felt so crazy at the time that I did it. The cornfield I'm showing you on the right, literally that's what was outside my dorm. Like I could walk into cornfields at any point that I wanted to. And I was at this teeny tiny college surrounded by them and it was marvelous. So they just opened a brand new arts building I got to help curate shows with other students. I had great professors. Um, I am I am with joy. I just booked my tickets to fly back to Iowa for my 20th reunion this summer. Um, I just, I can't say enough good things about it. And it was one of those where had it been left to me, I never would have even applied. So, you know, thank goodness for a father who pushed me out of my comfort zone. Um, I was an art history major at Grinnell. So, I, I went for English because that's what I thought I knew. Um, I signed up for a painting class my first semester because I, you know, I kept taking these art electives because I really liked art. Didn't get into the painting class, so got put in art history instead. And this light bulb went off and I was like, oh my God, this is it. Like I get pictures in all of my books. I still get to write, which is the English part. I get the history, like I get all of it. And oh, by the way, I'm way better at this than I am at actually 
painting. I then did take painting classes and thank goodness the professor let me get extra credit for like writing about other students' works. Otherwise my GPA would have tanked. Um, but anyway, so that, that was my Grinnell experience. Um, after Grinnell, you know, I knew I wanted to go into grad school. I took a year off, um, which I highly recommend to anyone and everyone who's gonna make the grad school leap. Um, so I did an internship one summer. I moved back home with my parents, I made some money. I chilled out for a year. Um, and then I started applying to schools again. And again, similar story. I applied to only schools on the coast, East Coast, West Coast. I, I, I covered both oceans this time, but you know, I was gonna get back to places with water. And then at the 11th hour, one of my advisors from Grinnell called and said, I wanna make sure you applied to the University of Kansas. And I said, what? I'm not, I'm not coming back to the Midwest. I'm, I, I did that bit. She said, no, no, you will love the program. It's fabulous. I said, okay, I've kind of done this route before. So let me listen to her. So I applied, got in, got a nice scholarship, went next best decision I've ever made in my life. Um, tremendous people, amazing mentors, an amazing museum to work in, a town that I fell in love with. Um, basketball school, you will all see that that rubbed off on me later on. Um, you know, so again, you, you land where you land. Um, I, I went in not really certain what, um, you know, my graduate work would be focused on. Um, I went thinking maybe I'd only do the master's and quickly decided I wanted to do a PhD um, and had the great fortune. And this is one of these like seize the opportunity in front of you. When I got there, the museum, the campus museum, had just been given a full collection of prints by this artist. Um, his name is Roger Shimamura. And he was a professor at the University of Kansas. He's since retired, um, but a nationally recognized artist. And he'd just given a gift of all of his prints. And the museum was looking for a student to do some research on them and put together a book project. And I didn't really know the work. I was a little bit familiar with it, but I thought it was interesting. And I raised my hand and said, can I do it? And I did, and I fell in love with the work and then made it into my dissertation. Um, you know, so for those who aren't familiar with the PhD program, I mean, the dissertation is sort of your life for about four to seven years. Um, and, and I picked this artist in part because I love the work and in part because he was there. My research was with a living, breathing artist that I could talk to all the time. I wasn't applying for grants to go to Rome, to go all these other places where my colleagues were going. I bought cups of coffee and drove over to his studio. Um, and it was remarkable. And, you know, I mean, there are some people who working with the living artists is not, not their thing. They want the historic stuff. Um, but for me, that made all the difference in the world to work with someone who answered my questions, let me into the archives and let me work with the material. So, you know, opportunity seized and one that I'm forever grateful for. Um, again, thought I'd probably leave the Midwest when I finally graduated and took a job. Year before I graduated, a job opened in Wichita, Kansas, and another advisor said, you really need to apply for that job. And I said, yeah, no, I really don't. And I said, plus I'm not done writing yet. I'm not gonna go take a job before I'm done. And he said, nah, it's a two hour drive. You're close enough. I promise I'll come down and like, you know, smack you if you're not getting your writing done, I'll keep tabs on you. So I moved to Wichita, Kansas, um, another great, you know, a great move, random place. I never thought I would be amazing museum. Um, this is the front of the museum. This is this incredible mosaic by Juan Miro. Um, you see it sparkly and shiny here. This is an after picture. When I got there, it was in disrepair. So one of the opportunities that I didn't necessarily choose, just had to deal with, was that within a year of my getting there, we had to take that entire mural down for major conservation work, which was like a science learning experience for me because I got to work with conservators and learn how all of that happens. Um, but at the same time, we had to do some repairs within the building. And so within like my second year of my first full-time curatorial job, I had no galleries. So I had to quickly on the fly teach myself how one does public art. Um, and so I worked with an artist named Tony Fair, 
who did, did this project all around campus. These are um, pop bottles that are painted a bright fluorescent orange like caution tape and then filled with water and strung around campus. Um, we could talk more about his work. It's fabulous. This is just a tiny part of it. But one of these like, oh my gosh, I've just been trained how to do gallery shows and now I have no galleries, but let's learn what that's all about and I'll do public art for a while. Um, from Wichita, I, I, I kind of for a moment made my way back kind of towards the West Coast and kind of towards my family. I got a job in Scottsdale, Arizona, the Scottsdale Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, this was a big jump for me. If you'll notice, all the last slides had little university logos in the bottom left corner. This was my first job that wasn't in an academic institution. So the City Art Museum. I'm purposely showing you an image of it at nighttime because it was known for its nightlife. Like we did evening programming like nobody's business, which I clearly had not really done as part of a university art museum before. Um, you know, complete with bars and kind of raucous parties and, and all the other things. Um, we had this crazy space that was called the Smoka Lounge where we did literary programming. We, I kid you not, did arm wrestling competitions. We did like every crazy thing under the sun. Um, and, and the way it worked when I landed, you know, they had a whole bunch of shows on the calendar for the first two years that I was there. So I didn't have major projects on the books. And so instead I jumped in and helped on the programming completely outside of my realm of knowing anything. Like the woman who was running these was a theater person. And I just jumped on as sort of her sidekick and learned so much. It was incredible. Um, and then I landed here in North Carolina, which is fantastic. Um, back to a university art museum. So as fun as Smoka was, and as much as I loved all that wild programming, and, and there were things I could do there that I probably will never get to do at another museum ever, I missed being part of academia. I had learned that about myself, that I, I am nerdy and I like to be around other people who have their noses in books. I like to have faculty and I like to have students as my partners. And so I went and found another university job. Um, the Weatherspoon has given me just remarkable opportunities. You know, the first one when I landed was that I had been working on a show for like almost five years on this theme of fairy tales and, and it traveled with me and they embraced it and let me land with it and let me run with it. Um, so you see the catalog here on the left um, and an image of one of the, one of the showstopper pieces on the right. This is an almost life-size Cinderella carriage made out of crystallized rock candy. Um, and we can talk about more about that too, if anyone's curious. Um, but one of the one of the projects I am most grateful to the Weatherspoon for, and this comes back to me mentioning basketball at Kansas, and maybe why I so much love the picture of those sneakers earlier. Um, you know, when I was at the University of Kansas, I drank the basketball Kool Aid, and I became a basketball fan in a big way. And I started dreaming up an idea for a basketball show. But it was a show that I never wanted to do until I was in a place that would love basketball as much as I do, more than I do, preferably. Um, and when I landed in North Carolina, I knew I'd landed in the right spot and the Weatherspoon was game to let me take this on. Um, we opened this show um, in February of 2020. <laughs> Um, it was time to coincide with the ACC tournaments being played here in Greensboro. It was gonna be all things basketball spectacular. And then of course the pandemic shut it down. But we had one month of awesome basketball fun. And then we reopened it the following fall for a couple months when we all came back. Um, and this is one of those of, you know, embrace the place where you are. You do the projects that are right for where you have landed and you let the world throw you where it throws you and you land in the right space to do the projects that you want to do. Um, so I will stop there. I talked more than I intended to, I'm sorry, but um, I would love to take your questions and I'm actually gonna stop sharing my screen so maybe I can see faces. Well, I, I'll actually start, I'll be selfish and start with a question because I can relate with a lot of, of what you just described. And my, my path was a little different. I started with the museum and then wound up in the, um, the university setting which I love. Um, I'm wondering if now that you've had kind of a taste of both, 
do you do you see yourself kind of moving back into the sphere of the the nonprofit art museum rather than the university setting? And if so, do you think it will be like kind of relearning what you may have have unlearned about museums because they are a completely different animal? They are. Um, you know, I mean, my my knee jerk reaction is to say no. Like I am, I am in academia for the long haul, but you know, I mean, I also said, no, I'm not moving to the Midwest and no, I'm not staying in the Midwest. And like, so I, I don't pretend to know anything about where I will land, you know, for right now, I adore being at the Weatherspoon, you know, so I'm not going anywhere in the, in the near future. Um, But what I think is great about sort of jumping between the two is having those different perspectives. And so there was a certain, you know, I, I brought my academia with me to Smoka when I was in that job. And I think that was great. And there were connections I was able to build with the universities around me that were great. But there's also just sort of a a, a certain way of, of working, a sort of methodical research way that I work that was interesting to intersect into that space. And I don't mean to say that that museum didn't do incredible research. They did really smart shows. There was just, there was a different vibe to it. Um, But then I think, you know, it also busted me wide open in terms of what I thought museum programming could be. And I've been able to take that with me other places, Um, you know, and of course there's university rules. So there's only so, you know, so crazy one can get on campus. Um, But I like that it pushed me to think outside the box and I'll I'll always treasure that. So we'll see if I I wind up in another place like that at some point. Anybody else have questions? It can be anything. It can be like random, like, (laughs) I don't know, any art world thing. It doesn't have to be anything about what I talked about. Do you have like a specific art piece or a couple art pieces that like you feel like have really kind of like inspired or left an impression on you? Mm, that's a great question. Um, there is a piece by an artist and I'm going to forget the title of the piece. So you have to forgive me on this one, but the artist is Alfredo Jar, who is a, um, Chilean born artist, he's based in New York now, and he does these incredible installations that are generally photography based, um, but they're often about something terrible and tragic going on in the world. Um, And there was a moment, I must have been in high school, I think, that I went on a trip to Chicago with some family and they had a show there and there is an installation piece he'd done, it filled a whole room. And it's this piece that's full of giant oil barrels and the oil barrels are full of water. And there's like a grid of them in the middle of the room. They make this huge square. And above them are hanging these light boxes with faces of people. And so when you look into the oil barrels, you see their reflections on there. And the piece is about, um, now you have to forgive me. I can't remember if it was in Nigeria. Um, or, or where the location was, but a town had had more or less sort of been swindled into taking oil waste from a company and it had ultimately poisoned their water and, and made the town sick. So it was this calling our attention to this tragedy, but it like shook me to my core when I went in and saw it. And it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, I mean, art can be interesting formally and, and that can be enough. Um, for some work, but art can also really be about who we are as humans, how we interact with each other as humans, and what is going on in this world around us, Um, and that's where I get crazy passionate about works of art, and that was the one that just like completely convinced me to my core that that was possible, that that could happen with works, so um, apologies to Alfredo, I'm not remembering the title of the of the piece it'll come to me later it's okay i think i, I think it's uh it was it was it water after all i just looked it up very quickly I did think. you look it up and it might yeah. be, it sound quite right but it but it it's it might be something like that gotcha and and i think you know that echoes emily what you were saying about keeping your you know staying receptive to to things and keeping your options open 
you know, professionally, but also I think too, in terms of the art, because, you know, you never know what you're going to even stumble upon that may have an effect on you that you, you, you weren't expecting. And, you know, art is about the moment and the, the being in front of something at, at a time that, I mean, I know that I've been in front of pieces that I didn't, I'm, I'm wondering why this is moving me so much, but it has an impact. And, you know, I think that as we evolve and change as individuals, so does, you know, art and how it speaks to us. So keeping yourself open and receptive of what art can give you back, I think is important too. Yeah. I, I will add one fun anecdote to the end of that, which is that, you know, so that would have been, I don't know what year that would have been in, but some probably 10, 12 years later, I got to do a show with him when I was at the Old Ridge Museum in Wichita and we did a major, you know, video installation with him. Um, and, and it was this amazing sort of, I don't know, the full circle is the right term, but, you know, a thing I never would have imagined when I saw that piece that I would actually get to spend time and work with that artist, you know, came to be 10 years later. So, you know, you never know what wonderful things you're going to, you know, be able to pursue and, and follow that thread. Other questions? Because I have another one if no one has one. <laughs> Anybody? Well, I'll go ahead and ask mine then. Um, so I'm wondering how your your current your curatorial perspective maybe has changed from working at an art museum, a nonprofit city-owned art museum, and a university art museum. Um, I mean, certainly different audiences in lots of ways, um, different, I guess, kind of um, object objectives to shows that you are curating. And have you seen you have you noticed that you've had to kind of shift your curatorial perspective from one to the other based on your audience? You know, I don't know that I shift my perspective per se, but I might shift the focus. Um, you know, I mean, one of the things that I really feel strongly about is that if you are at a university art museum, you need to be responsive to your university community. And so you need to be putting together the shows that can be used for teaching where you are at. Um, and so, you know, depending on where I am and depending on the moment in which I am at any one of those, you know, what else is being taught on campus? What issues are on the fore for people on campus at that moment? Who are my potential collaborators on that campus? And that may lead me to pick, um, you know, I've always got files of potential shows going that I would love to, you know, that I've dreamed up partially and I would love to pursue, but which one of those do I pull out of, you know, the giant file cabinet? More and more, I guess it's a digital file cabinet, but which one do I grab and focus on you know, is is different depending on the audience that I'm going to offer it to. Um, I think by and large, my perspective is always that I really love shows that have sort of a broad entry point and then get us to talk about heavier topics, maybe. I mean, so a show I didn't show on here that I did um, at, at the Ulrich and then it actually went to Smoka with me was a show on grocery stores everybody knows what a grocery store is. Like that's an easy entry point in terms of a subject. But then you got into the show and it was artists looking at food insecurity and food deserts and commercialism and like all these other topics. That fairy tale show, we all know fairy tales. That's an easy entry point. But oh my goodness, these fairy tales are actually about all kinds of psychology and power struggles and gender issues and all of that. Basketball. Everyone can walk like everyone knows what basketball is, but that show was really about economics, power, race, gen like all these other topics. And the artists give us those entry points. So you can pick something that's broadly um, accessible or appealing or engaging. And then you can work with those artists to then bring all these other topics to the fore. Those are the projects I get super excited about. Do, do you think some of those shows that you have curated for the university audience, uh, for example, the To the Hoop, the basketball exhibition, um, 
I mean, you did mention that, you know, you were organizing that show kind of along the schedule of, of, of basketball, but how do you feel or do you feel it would have been received differently if you would have opened that show in Scottsdale at that museum rather than UNCG? Yeah. So, you know, when I was putting the show together, I, the show was supposed to tour. It, it had another venue that it was going to go to that got scrapped because of COVID. Um, but when I was putting together the tour, I was reaching out both to other university art museums on campuses that had strong basketball programs for that would be a love, but then also museums in cities that had particularly strong basketball ties. Um, and I, you know, I think the reception would have been similar programming might have been different. Yeah. You know, if you'd wound up in a place that had, you know, a major, you know, NBA or WNBA team in it, like that might have driven the way that you were framing some of the programming. Whereas, you know, we had intended to do more things with like faculty responding to different things within the show. Um, you know, the fairy tales project that I did, it went from us, it ultimately, it went on tour also. And one of its stops was the Akron Museum of Art. So a, a city museum, not an academic institution. So that's why I say, I don't think the perspective changes. Like I've traveled these shows from academic museums to non-academic museums, and they work in both places. But I think the way you do the programming and the way you engage with it is a little bit different. Anybody else have any questions? Well, I will ask one more before we, we close out the session, but in that digital filing cabinet that you have, is there one that you're really kind of holding on to and focusing on right now that will is taking up some time and, and we'll see at the weather spoon? There are there are two. One is actually in the works. You can come see it this fall. Um, and then one is still just a brainchild. And I can't promise you that it will ever actually land in the galleries or not, um, but I don't mind sharing. So the one that will open in the fall is called Gilded Artists Explore Value and Worth. Um, and it is what it says. Everything in the show has gold leaf on it. So everything has literally been gilded. Um, yeah, similar to you know the other shows I've just mentioned, you know that that is a starting point. You know we we all know gold and everything, and it is stunning and beautiful. And then these artists open up these amazing conversations about who and what we value and why. Um, so that will open in September. It'll be up almost the entire academic year next year. So there's lots of opportunity to, to come up to Greensboro and, and come visit and see it. The one that's rattling in the back of my head that, you know, who knows where it will happen or what will come of it is a show on um, tattoos and contemporary art. Um, I, I do not have a single tattoo. So this is like so out of my realm of, <laughs> of, of anything. Um, but I am, I am fascinated and there's some interesting historical stuff to, to dig into that lets me use my, um, you know, my quote unquote classical training in, in American art. I can go all the way back to the 19th century and start pulling references. So we'll, we'll see if that takes shape and when. Awesome. Well, I think those are two very great ideas. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing them both. Well, thank you. <laughs> well, if there aren't any other questions, uh, Emily, thank you again so much for being the juror this year and for sharing uh, your your professional practice and a little bit of your story with us this evening. And um, when when does Gilded open? It opens on September 10th. Okay. Well, we need to get some people together and make a group visit then. Yeah, do a field trip. Yes, we will do that. And and thank you so much. Um, thank you. Thank you to all the artists for letting me, you know, enjoy your work. It was really a treat. Yeah. And and thanks to all the artists for for submitting. I mean, you know, like I said, every year is we we don't know what to expect, but it's always such great work. And uh, the students we have are, are amazing. So uh, so here's to 2022 jury student exhibition and uh, we'll move on to the next and hopefully we'll get to see all your smiling faces in the gallery next time.
but uh, but thanks again. Congratulations to all the artists, and remember that the award winning pieces uh, will be on view at the side gallery in upstairs row until the March thirty first. So thanks everybody, and everybody have a great weekend. Thank you.